Good morning, Gillsburg. It is good to see everybody this morning. We welcome you to Gillsburg Baptist Church. If you're visiting with us, we're so glad that you chose to worship with us this morning, and you're welcome back at any time. If we could help you with anything, please grab one of our deacons or one of our staff members, and we'd be glad to point you in the right direction. If you would, please pull out your bulletin. We'll go through a few announcements before we turn it over to Brother Doug. I want to remind you that this is the week of prayer uh, for North American missions. It goes through March the 6th through the 13th, uh, the week of prayer. So please uh, have that on your prayer list or have, have a reminder in your phone or something. Think about that and pray this week for North American missions. Uh, Wednesday night uh, will be our business meeting night. Uh, the supper will be served at 5.30 at 6 o'clock. The adults will break into the business meeting and the children and youth will break into their groups. And then at 6.30 after the business meeting, there will be choir practice uh, for those that are, are part of the choir. So remember our services on Wednesday night, supper beginning at 5.30, the business meeting beginning at 6. I know I've had a lot of comments that some folks can't get here in time for supper at 5.30. Uh, because of work and I just want to let you know it doesn't matter if you can't make supper no big deal Just show up at six okay show up at six no big deal uh, we'll we'll feed you leftovers uh, after we have to so don't think that if you can't be here at 530 that you can't come and be a part of our midweek services we'd love to have you here at six on Wednesday night also I want to announce that the women on missions will have a meeting on March the 14th March the 14th at six o'clock in the multi-purpose room, so put that on your calendar if you're part of that group. Uh, be in prayer for our nail benders, that they are currently in Daytona Beach, Florida, uh, building a beach house church, and then they'll come back at the end of, uh, actually they'll leave out again at the end of the month and first of next month and head to New Waverly, Texas, uh, to the Gospel Lakes Ranch. So be in prayer for those guys that are gone uh, currently, and uh, be in prayer for that organization as they continue to do stuff throughout the year. There is a bowl a prayer bowl, a new prayer bowl that was built by Mr. James Clark that's been placed in the foyer. And it's a, it's a prayer bowl, and we have these cards here, these prayer request cards uh, sitting by that bowl. And we just ask it will help us uh, keep our prayer list updated each week. Uh, if you could write down, if you have family members, friends, uh, any type of prayer request or update, if you could put that on the card and lay it there in the bowl, uh, that will greatly help us and keeping our prayer list up to date. So please start to try to utilize that, and you'll see that in the foyer uh, there as you go. <clears throat> also have an announcement that I know you'll want to put on your calendars. Vacation Bible School. Vacation Bible School VBS will be June the 12th through the 16th. June the 12th through the 16th. I know you'll want to go ahead and put that in your phones or on your calendar, uh, plan your vacations and, and ball and stuff around that best you can. June the 12th through the 16th will be BBS Vacation Bible School. So be in prayer for that as uh, folks start thinking about where they want to serve uh, that week, what class they want to teach or how they want to serve, and then be in prayer for all the young kids uh, that will be here that week and visiting with us. And uh, we just pray that God's will be done uh, that week in BBS. Also want to remind everyone that next week, next week, uh, Daylight Savings Time starts Okay, so you will spring forward, spring forward one hour uh, next week. Otherwise, you're going to be a little off for a couple days. So spring forward uh, one hour uh, next week in order to get, get your time right. Any other announcements that I need to make this morning? If not, I want to share a couple things with you. As you know, uh, we finished up our study of the book of Revelation last Sunday night. And then this came across... Uh, came across my desk. I want to read it to you. Regardless of what your biblical eschatology is, as a believer, you should live with the absolute assurance that the day will come when the Lord's name will be hallowed. His kingdom will come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Count on it. So regardless of what your biblical eschatology is, uh, he is coming, his name will be hallowed, his kingdom will come, and his will will be done on this earth. And then the second thing I want to share with you before I get down. The circumstances around you are never bigger than the Christ inside of you. The circumstances around you are never bigger than the Christ inside of you. Hope that uh, brings a smile to your face and gives you some hope as we start to worship uh, this morning. Brother Doug, it's all yours. 
if you looked at your order of service this morning, you could probably recognize the theme. We sing about his love for us today. The scripture says, I loved you, never remained in my love. Oh, how he loves you and me. Let's stand as we sing, please. Father, we're just truly grateful for the fact that you loved us so much that you sent your son down the earth to die on the cross for our sins so that each one of us would have the opportunity, the choice, to follow him. We thank you for that, Lord. We love you so much. And because of that love that you have shown us, Lord, it gives us, uh, we should imitate you and we should love others because of the love that you love us with. Because you forgave us of our sins, we should forgive others. We're truly grateful for the fact that you loved us so much that you sent Jesus to us. We just pray, Lord, that we lift you up this morning, Lord, that it's all about you. It's not about us. We don't want to be that church that we leave and say, we didn't get anything out of worship today because it's not about me. It's not about us. It's all about you, Lord. We want to praise you. We want to lift songs up to you. Uh, we want to pray towards you, Lord, and we want to hear what you have to speak to us through Brother Vic this morning. We just ask you to keep us safe as we worship this morning. Keep us safe as we depart here. And we pray, Lord, that everything that's done here in this service brings glory and honor to your name. We're truly grateful for the fact that you sent your son to die on the cross for our sins. And we pray all this in his name. Amen. Amen. Okay, my little buddies, come on down. So how are y'all? What a pretty smiling face. Come on, little Amelia and Delaney and Carolyn. Well, you know what the Bible says? The Bible says, though our sins be as red as blood, Jesus can wash them whiter than snow. Now, how do you think he does that? How could he turn a red sinner into white snow? Well, I'm going to show you how. This is going to be Miss Lawanda. Everybody get him a red. Everybody's a sinner. You got your red one? Everybody's going to be a sinner. Everybody in this church is a sinner. Do you know Brother Vic's even a sinner? Miss Brother Austin. He's really a sinner sometimes. I have to straighten him out all the time. So, all right, I'm going to take my sin body and I'm going to stick it down in Jesus' forgiveness. Everybody stick their bodies down in the forgiveness. <clears throat> Come on, Carolina. You and Everybody stick their cells down in there. What's happening? What color? White. White. Oh, I didn't get Kyle. Just get it in there, Kyle. We don't want you not to be forgiven. This is how easy it is to get forgiven. It's to do what? How do you get forgiven from your sins? Pray and ask. See how easy and quick that happened? 
We stuck all this all the way down in there, and I put the lid on this, and I put our whole body in there. Then we're all, our whole self is going to be together. <coughs> Not just little of us, but all of us. What once was red is now white by God's, Jesus' forgiveness. Isn't that a wonderful thing? All we have to do is to ask Jesus to forgive us. Though our sins be as scarlet or as red as blood, we can be white as snow again. Isn't that wonderful? <coughs> and that applies to the littlest one from Carolyn all the way up to the oldest one out there, whoever that is, Mr. Charles, I guess. <coughs> Even at 92 years old, Mr. Charles still sins. But you know what he does? He asks Jesus to forgive him, and he is white as snow. Can you remember that? Always pray. And as soon as you do something wrong, you say, Jesus, please forgive me, and I won't do it again. Okay? Is that a good deal? All right, Kyle. I mean, Luke. Dear God, thank you for this gate. Keep ever I safe. I help my daddy and my mama and my mom be safe. And I love my grandpa and my mama. And I hope they be safe. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise Him, praise Him, all you little children. God is love, God is love. Praise Him, praise Him, all you little children. God is love, God is love. In Psalm it says, He lifted me out of the slimy pit. He set my feet on the rock. And in 1 John it says, God showed His love among us. He said, "Is one and only Son." Let's stand and sing. Love is a theme. Love lifted me. All the things that men have known, one supremely stands alone through the ages. It has shown love is wonderful.
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this another day. Thank you for this beautiful weather you sent our way and the change of seasons which, which we can see and visibly see your presence and how you oversee all things. Uh, thank you for this church and this community. I pray that you will be with us. Help us to open our ears and hear a word from you today in song and in message. We lift up those of our uh, membership and our friends and family that need your healing hand this time. I pray that you'll be with them, be with the doctors and nurses that attend them, help them to restore or go back to their original health with your guidance. We also lift up uh, the activities around this world. Lord, we, we know that you're in full and complete control. I pray that you will be with all those that uh, are involved in the decisions that are affecting so many all across the world. Please, uh, if it be your will, let it be some kind of peaceful resolution and we can uh, somehow in some way see your glory uh, in all things that, that happen. Lord, forgive us where we fail you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I've been through loss and I felt the bitter sting that comes from a cold goodbye. Shut myself off from everything around me with nothing left but a hole inside. And there are days when all I I've almost given up a couple times, but he never gives up on me, and he holds every broken piece. There are days that I run, but I'm never out of reach, cause he never gives up. my back I've given him the coldest shoulder I said no over and over but still he welcomes me with arms spread open wide with a love I can't deny is real no he never gives up And he holds every broken piece. There are days that I run, but I'm never out of reach, cause he never gives up on me. He is good. Never gives up on me, and he holds every broken piece. There are days that I run, but I'm never out of reach, cause he never gives up on me. people said amen thank you brother Doug. what a precious thought that is um, he never gives up on us thank you for sharing that with us this morning good to see you in God's house today it's good to have all of you here I know this is that season of the year when the weather gets pretty 
and everybody gets uh, ready to travel, and it's spring break, and uh, we know that, but we thank you for your faithfulness today. I want us to turn to the book of Acts this morning and look at a couple of passages of Scripture there as we continue our thinking today. Look with me there in Acts chapter 1 and one verse in Acts chapter 2. They're right close together there. I want to talk this morning about the price, the price of Pentecost. In Acts chapter 1, the Bible tells us about an event in the life of Jesus and the disciples, and Jesus gives some very specific to instructions to these whom he has been so closely related with for this period of time. The scripture says in Acts chapter 1, we we'll begin reading in verse 12. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called the Mount of Olives, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. When they arrived, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying. Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot and Judas, the son of James. All these were continually united in prayer, along with the women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. And then in chapter 2, there, verse 41, near the end of chapter 2, the scripture says, So those who accepted his message were baptized, and that day... About 3,000 people were added to them. Jesus here instructed the disciples to wait, to wait for the Holy Spirit of God, for the promise that was coming. And our passage tells us, uh, biblical scholars corroborate, that, that about 10 days went by between these two passages that we read there. Acts chapter 2 notes the day of Pentecost arrived. The scripture says there was a sound, if you read that entire passage, there was a sound like a mighty rushing wind. There was symbols there, like a flaming tongue of fire that came and, and rested over every one of those in that assembly there that day. There was speaking that was unusual. Glossolalia is the, the correct term for it. The scripture simply says they spoke in other languages. Now, I know that's a matter of controversy, but it doesn't need to be because all of them were filled with the Spirit. And the focal verse is the one that we read there in verse 41. For the scripture says the upshot of the whole matter that day, no matter where you're looking at signs and symbols or glossolalia, the real key to this whole passage is the last phrase there where it says 3,000 people were saved on that one day. That's the real miracle, you see. That's the real thing that we need to focus on in this passage. Now, I know some of you have heard and maybe have said, and I have too, boy, don't we wish that could happen to our church today? And we do. We're rightfully so. We'd love to, to see that fresh wind. We'd love to have the, the fire to fall on our fellowship, on our congregation. We'd love to see something like that here in the 21st century. We'd love for the Spirit of God to sweep across us and to see something of this nature happen, wouldn't we? We'd like to see that happen. But I say to you, and you need to understand this as I've had to come to understand it. Acts chapter 2 would not have happened without Acts chapter 1. There's a price to be paid for Pentecost. There is a price to be paid for Pentecost. Let me give you a simple example. Each week. The wonderful music that we have. Just one example. That doesn't just happen. Somebody pays the price. 
Carolyn practices. Terry practices. They know these instruments. The choir practices. Brother Doug practices. The instrumentalists are all coordinated. Our sound is set up and somebody is operating that. A couple of three people usually are working there. That doesn't just happen. That's the same thing with a ball team. A baseball team doesn't just turn a flawless double play that makes you say, wow, that was great. Without practice, it doesn't just happen. The well-run office staff, the hospital, an efficient business. Now we order something online and in two days we expect it to be at our doorstep. And in many businesses, that's the case. Do you think that just happens? No. They have a system in place and everybody plays by the rules and they follow a certain uh, practice and, and they put that together. Somebody, in other words, pays the price. And that's what I'm saying to you. Acts chapter 1 sets forth the conditions for us. If the church is going to be empowered, if the church is going to be efficient, if we're going to be effective in witnessing, if we're going to be, in other words, a soul-saving station, somebody, and we've got to decide to pay the price. That's what this passage is saying to us. I read a story about a church at the end of the, of the church year, they, they had to do the same thing we do. We do it every year. We fill out an annual report. We don't say much about it because we fill it out. We have the information. We send it in to the, to the local association. It goes on to the state. But I read about a church that, that filled out their annual report at the end of the year. And there were some boxes to check off and some blanks to fill in. And it said, one of the blanks said, how many, how many folks did you bring into the church this year by by statement, zero. Next question, how, how many folks came into your church this year by, by transferable letter? Zero. The third one said, how many folks were baptized this year in your church? Zero. How many folks were saved, made professions of faith? In your church this year? Zero. And there was a space down at the bottom for notes and comments. And do you know what the church wrote in that? Pray that we will remain faithful. Now, at the risk of just being ugly, I thought, faithful to what? Faithful to what? What can we say at the end of the year with that kind of witness? Most churches, you see, are not willing to pay the price. Actually, this message is the, the second in a series. I didn't really tell you that last week, but I talked about Obedience, And I really brought the introductory message to you last week in a little different fashion. But, but, the, but the real question is, are we willing to pay the price? I talked to you last week about loving obedience. You remember that? Let me remind you real quickly. Prices to pay. I, I talked about loving obedience, and I talked about the things that, that we, we needed to do, that we must do, that we had to do. But there are several other prices to pay. And today, I, I want us to look at that in a little more detail. It's really easy for you to remember this. But this first price of Pentecost, actually the second price to you because I talked about it last week, but I want us to talk about the price that we pay in obedience here. Acts chapter 1 that we read. Let's go back. We didn't read all of these passages, but look what they did in verse 4. While he was together with them, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise. In verse 8, the scripture says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you will be my witnesses in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Then look at verse 12 that we did read. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey. Do you see any obedience in there? 
he first told them to stay. He said, and you're going to receive power, not just any power. It's not going to be what you would drum up or what some earthly individual is going to give to you, but it's going to come from the throne of grace. And he then told them to leave. So in all of that, they had to be obedient to what Christ was telling them. They could have left. They could have stayed. They could have been in the wrong place at the right time or vice versa. They could have done everything but obeyed. But did you see what happened? They were in the right place when Jesus told them where to be and when to be. And the fire of God fell on them because of their obedience. Because of their obedience. They were right there. You remember in the Old Testament, Elijah the prophet, he was at the brook Cherith. And the scripture says that the whole land was about starved to death. Elijah was about like that too. And God in that specific place sent the ravens, we'd say the crows, came and fed him. Do you think if he had been in a land of plenty where there was all kind of other stuff that maybe he could have starved to death because he was in the wrong place? I do. I think even in a land of famine, if God controls everything like I believe he controls everything, God took care of Elijah, and he's still able to do that. And he kept Elijah from starving by sending the crows to feed him when everybody else was dying of hunger because Elijah was obedient. The Scripture says also in the Old Testament, or, or, or in the story of Naaman, not in the Old Testament, but the Scripture says of Naaman, Naaman was terribly afflicted with a disease and, and, and he went and, and, and they told him to go, the prophet told him to go and, and wash in the river Jordan, not once, not twice, but seven times. Now that would be about like me telling you that you needed to go down to, to one of these creeks, not, not down to the Tangible Hole or, or uh, one of these other pretty rivers around here, but one of these mud holes, I have one behind my house. Go down there and dip in that mud hole. Are you kidding me? I've got some really nice looking places I could go dip in. How about one of them? No. No, I want you to go to the Jordan. And he did. And he dipped seven times and, and he obeyed God. And God, God made him whole. See, that's what obedience is all about. God's requirements are really not difficult. But he doesn't pour out his blessings upon us as individuals or us as a church when we're disobedient to him. That's not the way he works. Wouldn't it be wonderful if he always found us at the right place at the right time doing what he expects, where we need to be, where he tells us in his will. You see, there is a price to pay for Pentecost, and it's obedience, obedience. From the pulpit here to the pew out there. Now, I need to expand on that a little bit because we talked about that last week. I talked about loving obedience. And I said to you that that begins with our reverence of God, with right living and with some requirements. Love God with all your heart, he said. That's pretty simple. That's pretty straightforward. But, but there's more to it. If, if we really and truly love him with all our heart, if we really want to be obedient, if we really want the power, if we really want to cash in, <laughs> listen to that, if we really want to cash in, I want to tell you how simple God's plan really is. This will make perfect sense because my three points are A, T, ATM. Any of you use ATM this week? The first one is obedience in attendance. Obedience in attendance. The book of Hebrews says not staying away from our worship meetings as some habitually do, but encouraging each other and all the more as you see the day drawing near faithfulness in attendance makes a statement so does unfaithfulness 
So does unfaithfulness, our lack of commitment. Generally, if you look at a church and if you see sporadic attendance, if you see attendance when, when folks just were convenient or they don't have anything better to do or when they say, well, I, I feel like it or I don't feel like it, you see a church that's playing games and they're really not accomplishing a whole lot for God. That's just a simple truth. We, we live in a generation that says, I can do what I want. I can go when I want. I can come when I want. I don't commit. And, and, and that is true. Most preachers will tell you that in a heartbeat. They folks are, are really, really not into commitment today because it requires obedience. It requires that. God requires. We need a change. We need to get a change of our want to a lot of times, I think. I read an interesting story about a pastor who was new in the community. He went to visit this couple. They were a wonderful young couple, and, and they had a little old dog that was playing around in the room there, and it was obvious as they sat and visited that dog was just jumping on them, and, and they loved that dog, and that dog loved them, and it, it was just, and he finally, he, he didn't know the area, and he didn't know these people, and he finally said something, you know. He said, you know, he said, I bet you two would make great parents. He said, the way y'all love that dog, and the way y'all care for that dog is just so obvious. And, and he said, I bet you would make great parents. Well, the woman began to weep so much that she got up and left the room. And the pastor realized that something terrible had happened and he had caused it to happen. And he began to apologize profusely to the husband who remained. He said, I, I'm so sorry. I know I, I must have said something wrong. He said, uh, please forgive me. The, the man finally stopped him. And he said, Brother so-and-so, you, you couldn't have known. But he said, we were parents. We had a, a little boy. And as a, as a little child, this, this dog was his. He said, they were absolutely inseparable and he said God in his wisdom saw fit to, to take our little son and he went away to heaven and he said that dog is our reminder of our son and he said pastor you may think this is simplistic and you may think this is silly but he said the reason that we love that dog in such a way it's a way that we show love for our son. We, we love that dog so much simply because our son loved it so much. And the pastor left there with this thought on his heart. And he said, we ought to love the church because God's son loved the church. The book of Ephesians says Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. You can't separate Jesus and the church anymore. You can separate the head from the body and still have a functioning body. You can't lift this building off of the foundation and still have a safe building. Hard to truly believe. When you talk with someone and they say, Oh, I love Jesus so much, but I don't go to church. There's just something wrong with that picture because we ought to love what he loves. And the scripture is clear on that. If we love the church, we show it by attendance. Now, let me tell you what we say. In, in faithful attendance, we say, Jesus, I love you. I love what you love. I want what you want. I care about what you care about. We, the church, have plenty of flaws and failures, but that's not what we're looking at here. We support and attend the church because we love Christ. And he loved the church and died, gave himself for it. And so in faithful attendance, we say, Christ, I love you. You can cut it any way you want to. You can paint it any way you want to. You can phrase it any way you want to. But that's a simple fact, and it's irrefutable. And secondly, in faithful attendance, we say pastor and staff and other workers in the church, we love you too. 
That's right. Yes, you do. It matters that Carolyn and Terry practice and Brother Doug coordinates our music and our hymns and our worship songs and finds new music for us to sing and, and choruses for us to learn and, and plans that all with Scripture in mind to prepare our hearts for worship. It matters. And when we come in faithful attendance, we say to the pastor and to the staff, you say to me and to Brother Austin, guys, we appreciate you for studying and for reading and preparing and for seeking God's will and for teaching the book of Revelation on Sunday afternoon until his tongue was hanging out. And we support you in doing that. It matters to me, and I'm going to support you by my attendance. It's the easiest thing in the world for me to do. But do you know also, in loving obedience, in attendance, do you know what else we say? We say to the other members, I love you too. Because we're a body. That's what Christ called us, and we, we function together. What if you got up this morning, or I got up this morning, and I, I got out of the bed, and my legs and my feet just decided they weren't going to work today? <laughs> Hit the floor, you know, Bam. I couldn't even get into the bathroom to start taking a shower, walk to the kitchen to eat breakfast. What if I got up this morning, you got up this morning, and, and your hands weren't working? Ladies, you couldn't dry your hair, and you couldn't put on your makeup. Oh, heaven forbid. No, I didn't say that. Pray that your hands keep working, you know. I mean, together... That, that, that's why, you know, we, I'm not talking about illness. I'm not talking about those of you that had COVID-19. I know I've been there, and some of you have. You know, I wanted to be here. The Scripture was evident in my life those days. The Spirit was willing, but the flesh was weak. <laughs> and some of y'all been there, too. I'm not talking about that. You know, I'm not talking about some of you that, that have to work. I know that I lived with a nurse for a long time. I know about working every other weekend, working weekend. But I'm talking about what we're saying on a routine, regular basis. We've, we've had great crowds we, recently. We've got a great crowd today. We had a great crowd last Sunday. Let me ask you a question. How many of you leave here on Sunday and you're going home? I mean, before you ever even get out of the shadow of the steeple here. And you're in the car there with your spouse. And you look at one another and you say, Boy, we had a great crowd today. And what a great service. Isn't it better when the pews are filled? I don't know about you, but from my viewpoint, it's better. It's a whole lot better. The singing is better. The encouragement is better. It's exciting. Somebody says amen. You applaud for the song. And we go home encouraged and, and filled. We say, what a great crowd and a great service we had today. Isn't it better that way? I want to tell you, obedience says, obedience says, I'm not going to be the one who is going to make us down today and make us have a bunch of empty pews. I'm not going to be a part of that. I'm not going to be the reason. I, I care about my pastor. I care about my staff and about the music director and instrumentalists. I care about my brothers and sisters in Christ. I care about and I love my Lord. And so I'm going to be obedient in my attendance. That's the price we pay for a Pentecost experience, a fresh wind and fire, the movement of God in his house. That's the A in the ATM. The second price that we pay in the ATM, first is attendance. The T is for tithe. Oh, there he goes again. He just can't quit. This, this is not about Gilbert Baptist Church having a larger bank account. That, that's not what it's about. It's about obedience and blessing because that's what God's word is teaches you know it, 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 no matter what you have no matter what you make God is not concerned with that the wisdom of God is this perfect plan that he has ordained 
that, that we can operate within the framework of that. Think about what Malachi 3.10 says. Malachi 3.10, bring ye all the tithes in the storehouse. Bring the full tenth, my translation says, into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. Test me in this way, says Lord of hosts. Now, this is not a tithing sermon, but I want to give you two or three quick things out of this passage right here that are worth thinking about taking home. First of all, notice that he commands us to give a specific portion. Bring the full tenth. That's what tithe means, a tenth. Do you know that that is so simple you can teach a child that? You can teach that definite portion. Just get ten dimes, and you can figure that out from there. You know what to do. I mean, that couldn't be any easier with ten dimes, a simple ten percent. Notice also he says there's a designated place. Bring it to the storehouse. That's, that's here. I, I know Malachi didn't know that one day we'd have banks and one day we'd have online giving. I think it's easier today than it ever been before. You can go on there one click and it's done. You don't even have to think about it hardly. And you can also put it on a recurring thing and every month it'll just take your tithe out of there every month. We've, we've, I mean, we've got it down to a fine science here. That's a definite portion to a designated place, to the, to the storehouse. That's a divine purpose in there. He said that there may be meat in my house, that there may be food in my house. Now, that's not talking about our Wednesday night meal. We do pay for that. We won't get that free. But, but that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about for all of the things that we do, that there may be meat in my house. And what does he say is going to happen? A dramatic blessing. I'll open the windows of heaven. You see, this is a defined benefit plan. Wow, some of you say it. Now, Brother Vic, tell me, if I decide to start tithing, what am I going to get? I don't know. I honestly don't know. But I'll tell you this. According to this word right here, I would like for you to see what that second phrase said. See if I will not open the floodgates. Of heaven. He didn't say if I'll drop you a few coins down there. You know what happened when you open the floodgates. You've been there. The floodgates of heaven and pour you out a blessing so that you will not be able to receive it. How much will I get? I don't know. Only God knows that. Someone said this. I have a good friend. There's a, there's a wealthy guy. And <clears throat> I heard him give a tithing testimony one time. And he said something that I thought was really strange that I found to be true. He said, you know, he said, y'all may find this strange that to, to hear me say this that about tithing. But he said, I just believe when you tithe that God does things that you don't even know. It comes through the floodgates, the windows of heaven, if you will. He said, I believe your refrigerator that was going to quit working may just work a little longer. And, and he, he listed off a whole bunch of other things. I never really had thought about it exactly like that. Now, I don't know whether he's right or wrong. I'm not going to test him out. I'll tell you that. Because somebody else wrote this. It says, tithing makes your roof stronger and your shoes last longer. How about that? <laughs> That's probably true. Someone else said there are two plans. Listen to this. There are two plans. You can live on 90%. And have God as your partner, or you can live on a hundred percent and go it alone. How's your plan working out? That's worth remembering. You tell me. And oftentimes we leave out verse eleven of this Malachi passage. Designated place, designated portion, and all of that. That that's fine. But look what this last thing says here. I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not ruin the produce of your land and your vine in your field will not fail to produce fruit, says the Lord of hosts. There's a whole sermon in that one verse right there, right there. Some say, well, 
I'm going to have to adopt an alternate method. I, I, I can't afford to give money, so I'll just give myself. I'll serve. That's wonderful. That's laudable. But I'll tell you, the Scripture said it is better to obey than to sacrifice. Obey better than sacrifice. Jesus says where your treasure is, there is where your heart will be also. A is for attendance. T is for tithing. M in God's economy is for ministry. Ministry. A-T-M, the third area. I, I'm so thankful that, that we live in, in, a, in an area that's growing with a growing attendance. I know we've had some sickness, and we've had a couple of difficult years, but hopefully most of that is behind us, and attendance is picking up. Can we improve? We sure can. Sunday school can improve. We had 81 this morning. I picked it, Brother Dalton, when he's putting that up on the board back there. And I said, man, I thought you were putting that one over there, and he was going to put one something. And he said, I'd love to. Wouldn't you? Can we do better in Sunday school? Sure we can. Can we do better in worship? Sure. Wednesday night? Oh, sure. We have the best meal anywhere around. And you're missing a blessing just coming and being with us on Wednesday night for a few minutes and fellowshipping around the table and having a great meal together. Youth needs you. Choir needs you. How many other things? I'm so thankful that you are a giving church that we still meet needs of those around about us who need whatever it is they need. We can can do it and we can continue to do it. May it ever be so that our ministry is that it's always a need for more to sing and to teach and to lead and to, to reach out in every area. But sometimes we're content to just sit back and let somebody else do it. I read about a guy who got sentenced to prison. And the first day he was in prison, he and his cellmate were walking around, and all of a sudden somebody hollered out, 43! And everybody around just fell out laughing. The whole cell block just died laughing. Well, a little while later, the same thing happened. Somebody called out, 29! And everybody just fell out. And that went on for for a little while. And finally, the new guy asked his cellmate, he said, man, he said, they didn't tell me about this. He said, what is the deal with these numbers? And, And everybody laughing. He said, well, he said, you see, we've all been in here. I said, most of us are lifers. He said, we've all been in here a long time. And he said, we don't know anything but the same jokes. And we've all heard them so many times. So we just don't tell them anymore. So we numbered them all. And he said, now, every once in a while, somebody just calls out a number. We already know the joke, so they call out the number. So that's why everybody laughed. The guy looked at him and said, hey, can I be a part of that? The guy said, sure. You're in here now like the rest of us. He said, okay. He walked over to the cell door and he stuck his head up through the bar and he said, 34. dead silence 34 dead silence he turned around looked at his cellmate he said man did I do something wrong he said no you just must be one of them guys that can't tell a joke All right. I promise you brother Austin and I look for new jokes every week and new things to tell you that will stir your curiosity and stir your thinking. We're not content just to come and call out the same old numbers. And hear that dead silence. I want to tell you all of we want to see ATM, attendance, tithing, and ministry in every way. So I want to ask you this morning. If God has stirred your heart with the simplicity of this message from the book of Acts and these early the disciples and early, what, is, what did he say to you? What did he say to you about attendance? What did he say to you about tithing? What did he say to you about ministry? Is it enough that you need to make a decision for him? Who needs to be saved today? I, I ask you just as honestly and simply and faithfully as I know how. 
Somebody, somebody needs to trust Christ today. Somebody needs to come down here and say, Brother Vic, you got me. I don't know what it is, but God says I need to be involved in ministry. What can I do? I don't know. We'll find it. Ashley's over here somewhere. We'll find her. VBS is coming up. Brother Austin already made the announcement. We need VBS workers. We need to get your name on the dotted line now and be here before we know it. June will be here. Choir, teacher, they'll be looking for teachers and officers before too very long. It won't be long at all. Make Brother Austin have a heart attack. Come volunteer for something. He'll follow. There's a price to be paid for Pentecost. Pray with me. Father, in the quietness of this moment at invitation time, this time when our hearts are turned strangely toward you, the simplicity of your word is, is just overwhelming to us. For you did not give to us a complicated thing which is difficult to understand in attendance or in our giving or in our ministry or in anything else things that were complicated and far beyond our comprehension you and you alone in love did by giving your son the Christ to take our sin debt and to go all the way to Calvary and there to die and pay the price how we thank you and praise you for that help us to emulate his love for the church today help us to come face to face with that which we need to to correct perhaps today. Maybe someone needs to be saved. Maybe someone needs to come on transfer of a letter in any other way that we receive members as the Gillsburg Baptist Church. Maybe someone would come today in a recommitment. I need to recommit for myself and my family. I, I'll be responsible, more responsible from now on because I love you, Lord. I love the church. I love the membership. I love the fellowship that we have here. I love the staff that we have and those that work so hard from week to week. Maybe someone would come some other way, some other decision that you've laid on the heart today. May we be honest and faithful and true before you in this invitation. And may things of eternal significance occur in these moments ere we leave this place just now. Bless, we pray, and be honored by that which we do in the matchless name of Christ. Stand quietly to your feet. And as you do, we're going to sing together a hymn of invitation, and as God leads, as he speaks to your heart this morning, would you come? Would you just step on out right now and come, Brother Doug? Lead us as we sing. Come on right now. Who'll be